memory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, uh, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Philip for appearing today to help make that possible. Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this fall, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Check out our online calendar to see what's still to come this season at townhallseattle.org. Uh, Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the ever-changing landscape. Uh, we hope you'll consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation uh, by clicking the, the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by becoming a member. The same is true for our partner booksellers. They've been hit by the negative effects of COVID as well. So if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Philip's book today, please use the link on the live stream page to purchase through Elliott Bay Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing it via the YouTube page stream that is linked in the chat here. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for re-watching immediately following today's broadcast. The presentation today will be about 60 minutes long, including Q&A. We will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen, and we'll also take questions from the YouTube chat. We can't guarantee that we'll get to every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching today. And now to our program. Philip Norman is a novelist, biographer, journalist, and a playwright. He's the author of the best-selling biographies of Eric Clapton, Buddy Holly, The Rolling Stones, John Lennon, Elton John, Mick Jagger, and Paul McCartney. At the age of 22, he joined the English newspaper, The Sunday Times, including later working as the newspaper's rock music critic, and soon gained a reputation as a columnist, columnist for his profiles of figures as diverse as Elizabeth Taylor, P.G. Woodhouse, and Little Richard. One of his assignments was to investigate and report on the problems afflicting the Beatles multimedia company, Apple Corps, which was followed in 1981 by the publishing of Shout, a groundbreaking biography of the Beatles that was a bestseller in both Britain and the US. He, is also, he has also written six works of fiction and two plays. Norman's book, Wild Thing, The Short Spellbinding Life of Jimi Hendrix is the subject of today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Philip Norman. Thank you very much, and um, very good to be uh, in Seattle, if only virtually. <clears throat> I have to say at the start that um, I grew up with great consciousness of Seattle because my maternal, um, my paternal grandmother, um, after the death of her much older husband in the First World War, actually came to live in Seattle with her sister, bringing my infant father and uncle, and I was always hearing about Seattle which at the time sounded a rather exciting, a bit sort of frontier sort of place. Talked about picnics where the bears would come out of the forest, just like Boo Boo and Yogi and eat their picnics. Um, and my father had a memory of the very steep streets and the Model T Fords, which could only negotiate these very, very steep hills by going into reverse. So that left me with a lovely surrealistic picture of Seattle with the compulsory teddy bears picnics and the backward whizzing Model T Fords. Uh, as um, Candy said, Candace said, um, I have written the, many of these books about very, very major rock figures. And each time that I do, uh, I firstly, I always try to choose the very, what I call the very top echelon. Those are the people who, whether they're bands or individuals, just whenever you mention their name, wherever in the world, you, you get a reaction. They are their influence. Uh, the influence of their music, of course, their personalities is so enormous. Um, and after the Beatles and the Stones and Clapton, um, as with all, always finishing these projects, I swore that I would never write another one because 
the, the task of turning pop music into a literate biography is very, very hard work. Um, but it seemed to me that in this case, the case of Jimi Hendrix, uh, that the book was kind of putting itself together without my permission. Uh, because um, firstly, a, a research associate that I only worked with many times pointed out that this year would be the 50th anniversary of Jimi Hendrix's very, very tragic and premature death in London. Um, <clears throat> then uh, I heard that his younger brother, Leon, five years younger than Jimmy and very much uh, um, protected by Jimmy in their childhood in Seattle, um, was coming to London uh, and then to Britain on a tour and I would be able to speak to him. And finally, uh, the man who in the old fashioned British way delivered my milk in North London, um, happened to let drop one day that in another life, he and his brother um, had been painters and decorators and they'd done up a flat for Jimi Hendrix near Marble Arch. that he was renting from the Walker Brothers, another great name from the 60s, um, and told me all sorts of things about Jimi, about the color of his bed sheets and how he threw his, all the fan mail uh, was thrown up across the bathroom floor and there was a, a, a cupboard full of gold discs that he never bothered to do anything with at all except as Ron, the milkman, remembered to cut up a bit of a weed occasionally with the edge of one of them. Um, and I realized that really there was no help for it but to go ahead with this book about Jimi Hendrix, um, who I then realized immediately does belong to this very tiny top echelon because um, in that age of the guitar superheroes in the 60s, um, uh, all of these other guitar heroes, uh, Eric Clapton, George Harrison, Jerry Garcia, Pete Townsend, they only had to hear Jimi Hendrix play once and they simply surrendered. They said, we cannot compete with this man. But rather than resenting him, and rock stars are quite prone to resentments and negative feelings, they simply adored him because he was adorable. Um, he was very sweet, very shy, completely the opposite of himself on stage where he pushed sexual boundaries and the 60s famous permissiveness beyond the limit, far more than Mick Jagger or Jim Morrison with the Doors, um, almost sort of in sexual assault on his guitar, which would end with um, him straddling it uh, and then setting light to it. And guitars normally are sick or worse, sacred objects to these uh, musicians, but Jimmy really treated, Jimmy's was more like a battered wife. He would eventually in those days before health and safety, just fling its burning carcass into the audience who loved it. No one thought how dangerous it was. So I did start to um, seriously look at this man's very, very short life. Um, uh, he died at the age of only 27. Um, this is a, has been a, a, a feature of some of the, the great iconic figures of rock. Almost, it's almost a sort of uh, entrance ticket into rock Valhalla to not to have reached the age of 30 and particularly to, to die. Uh, at the age of 27, there was Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones, there was Jim Morrison, there was Janis Joplin. Much earlier, there was the great blues player Robert Johnson. Later on, there was Amy Winehouse, Kurt Cobain. And it just seems to be, it, it is called uh, rather too flippantly, perhaps the 27 Club. And uh, Jimi Hendrix is the 27 Clubs, if you like, president for all eternity. Um, he was the most extraordinary virtuoso on a guitar. Uh, he didn't have, he didn't need to be anything else. Uh, most of these virtuosi simply stand there and show you their brilliance. But Jimmy also gave showmanship. So he was in that one package, a genius and an extraordinary exhibition, exhibitionistic showman. Uh, in, in private, he was completely different. He was quite unconfident. Um, he didn't particularly, he, he thought he couldn't sing, but he really didn't like singing at all. But actually, if you listen uh, to that voice, it, it, it isn't at all the, vo the, the voice of the blues and the voice of R&B and of soul. It doesn't have that rasp. That's because almost alone among the great African-American musical genii, he didn't grow up singing in church. Really, he, his family were such as it was, were, were too poor and not 
really respectable, uh, not considered not that respectable. So he didn't have that musical grounding in church. That's why the voice of Jimi Hendrix is this rather sort of smooth, rather mellifluous, uh, light baritone, which is uh, very unusual in rock, uh, still is, and uh, of course is the absolutely perfect counterpoint to this wild, rampant playing style that he had. Uh, the one thing that um, really, I suppose, in the end got me writing this book is that I've always thought that Jimi Hendrix's cover version of Bob Dylan's All Along the Watchtower, um, and he was someone who did cover versions. Most rock stars consider cover versions as, as rites of passage that they, when they're unknown, they cover other people. When they get their own distinct sound and style, then they don't do any more cover versions. Jimmy always did cover versions, and they were always brilliant. They were never copies. They were always reimaginings uh, of tracks that people thought could not be improved on. Um, the Beatles of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Jimmy covered within hours of it being released in London. And far from being piqued by this sort of effrontery, uh, Paul McCartney, who is no stranger to uh, accolades, said at the time it was one of the great honours of his life. And this uh, track, um, this cover of Bob Dylan's not terribly inspired song, not, not great, all time great Dylan track all along the Watchtower. Slightly sort of, I think, rather aimless and rather strangely constructed. And just when it seems to be coming to a sort of climax, it suddenly ends. Uh, Jimmy turned this into the most brilliant uh, recreation with one of, for me, that perhaps it's the greatest uh, hard rock solo ever. It's actually in the four parts, uh, more, more like a piece of classical music. Um, that above anything else, I would take on the mythical desert, desert island to listen to forever because you never get tired of it. So the fact that Jimmy came from Seattle was something unusual because it wasn't the place where these legends, R&B and soul, and the blues really came from. Uh, they certainly passed through Seattle. It was an important market. Um, and Jimmy, uh, but Jimmy really didn't sort of fit the profile because initially of coming from Seattle, he had a very tough childhood. His father was a hardworking man, but also a very hard drinking man um, who had married a, a, a very young bride and then gone off to fight in the war. And uh, Jimmy's mother, Lucille, was, wasn't really capable of taking care of him. And his father came back from the war to find that he'd been with foster parents, uh, very nice ones actually, a long way away in California. And Al Hendrick went to claim him. He'd actually been named Johnny Allen Hendrick. Um, his father firmly uh, renamed him James Marshall Hendricks. Um, but they got off on the wrong foot right at the start because Al was tough. Um, at the, what used to be called a man's man in those primitive days. Um, Jimmy was sensitive and thoughtful and uh, within a very short time after their reunion, Jimmy was in tears. And James actually grew up with the name of Buster. And this again sounds very unlike, uh, you know, the, the, the willowy, the beautiful, the slightly unworldly, uh, otherworldly possibly um, figure that he became in, later on. But actually, he was a rather useful athlete. He played baseball and football and could run, and, uh, but never um, was a very unstable life because, um, first of all, his mother and father, Al, drifted apart. They were both heavy drinkers. Al actually got the custody of uh, Buster and his young brother, Leon. Um, but really, in those days, um, because they had to really be left while Al was at work, Jimmy was 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 uh, Leon's protector, Leon five years younger, and particularly when there were dreadful rows in between the parents, when Lucille would come home, she would occasionally, um, then uh, Jimmy would be would shelter Leon from the the trauma of the awful rows and the sometimes physical fight, and so he was always much more of a, a, a surrogate father to to Leon. Uh, uh, Lucille died when. Uh, Jimmy was 14. This is a, a very common theme uh, I found with um, these major rock figures. They lose their mothers at a, an age, the early adolescence, uh, 
is a time when a boy's mum is perhaps even more important than when he was an infant. Um, and it was true of other people that I prof profiled and biographized. Uh, certainly John Lennon, who lost his mother, she abandoned him at quite an early age to, his, to her sister Mimi. Um, and she was always around uh, John's life, but then she was killed in a terrible car crash um, or car accident. Um, he was a bit older, he wasn't 14. Paul McCartney was 14 when his mother uh, died from breast cancer. Uh, Eric Clapton's mother gave him uh, a sort of huge chaos after the Second World War in, in Britain. Um, uh, Jimmy, uh, Eric's mother had married a Canadian serviceman and, and left, uh, left Eric, uh, known as Rick in those days, with, um, with his grandmother. And he had to grow up pretending that she was his mother. And his mother, when she finally came back to England, was his oldest sister. So this is a trauma that is somehow implants a terrible void in these young men, these boys and young men, which in the end can only really be filled by the adulation of an audience and it has to be continued. Um, so they never read, even today, McCartney, all his billions and all his fame and adulation still has to go on stage and prove that he can be loved like he always was and of course he still is. Jimmy then grows up really, um, as his brother Leon said, it was they were always a rock. It was kind of felt like being on a camping trip because they were always changing their addresses and uh, and they came to the notice of the Seattle Welfare Authorities and uh, um, tried various times to take take Jimmy when Jimmy got too old. Then they would take Leon away. Um, and by a, something that I never imagined could, I would find I would find in. The backstory of Jimmy. Then his mother afterwards gave birth to four other children. Um, uh, the father Al uh, denied paternity of some, or perhaps all of them, and uh, they all had um, uh, birth problems and were of varying seriousness. And they all, in, in the end, were institutionalised. So this was the most insecure grounding for. Buster as he became, but he, he picked up a guitar. Um, start, start, his father was a landscape gardener, but really was also a sort of clearer of debris from build, building sites. And um, Jimmy once found uh, uh, an old one string discarded ukulele, getting plucking the string, tightening it, and then plucking it at the sound, started him wanting to play something with strings and eventually led to him playing the guitar and to various um, little bands around Seattle. Um, but he, uh, he, he he liked to claim that he sort of had this very kind of um, raffish childhood or was in trouble with the Seattle Police Department. He, he really only was in trouble once. He was picked up for joyriding and a bit of sort of minor larceny or stealing something out of a store. And um, he was given the opportunity of choosing between either going detention in Seattle or joining the army. So he joined the Airborne Division and did rather well, initially made that parachute jump. Um, but in the end, um, left an honorable discharge, but having not been particularly distinguished because he'd started playing seriously. And from then he was a professional musician. Um, but in those days, um, the African-American musicians, even the very, very greatest of them, were, they played to segregated audiences. It was known as the Chitlin Circuit, very demeaning sort of title, but they recognized it as such and very few of them tried to resist. Um, only, I think in the sort of early, from the early 60s, Sam Cooke was really the only one who sort of crossed over to a white mainstream pop audience. And that was what Jimmy would eventually do. Um, he would not be confined to the supposed African-American genres of the blues, uh, soul, R&B. He completely broke out and he played uh, to white audiences and to um, African-American ones as well. But it was, it was he played, he, he was, a, he, at the very early stage, started listening to white rock and roll stars in the late 50s. And some of them were not very good singers, but they tended to employ wonderful session guitarists. Um, 
So it was James Burton on the Ricky Nelson records. Um, Buddy Holly was a big influence and Buddy Holly was a wonderful singer and songwriter and, and a brilliant guitarist, very unusually. And Elvis Presley, um, he used to sing uh, Leon <laughs> to sleep at night. <laughs> um, sing Elvis's Love Me Tender, which is a rather sweet sort of picture to have. So Jimmy could, he, he worked his way eventually to New York and even to playing in the, the, the coffee houses of Greenwich Village, where he did actually meet Bob Dylan. He became a, a, in a way, a sort of advertisement that he played so many Dylan songs right from the beginning of Dylan, where people would, you know, he would be derided uh, for playing what other African-American blue and blues people called hillbilly music. That's how Dylan was seen in those circles in those days. Um, but he couldn't really break out of that, um, of that segregated world unless he came to London. He came to London in the year 1966. Strangely, he had always had a, a dream that something amazing would happen to him in 1966, and it did, because he was playing in a very sort of um, humdrum uh, venue called the Cheetah Club in New York. Who should walk in? But the uh, then uh, girlfriend of Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. This was at the time in the rather the aftermath of the famous British invasion, um, where British act after the Beatles had sort of absolutely flooded. It was an invasion. It was a, an inundation of British musicians, mostly playing blues, which they were then re-exporting and R and B re-exporting back to the U.S., where they'd come from originally. Um, and her name, confusingly, Linda's girlfriend, uh, uh, rather, uh, Keith, Richard's girlfriend, was Linda Keith. And she was very, very sharp, very bright. And uh, she saw something amazing in Jimmy Hendrix. And, uh, but she simply told uh, someone else about him, which was uh, Chaz Chandler, who played in The Animals, who at the time were the second most, uh, the second favorite British band in the US after the Beatles. Uh, the animals were a disastrous uh, um, amalgam of personalities, very, very good. Um, but uh, Eric Burden, the singer, described them later on as a human fragmentation grenade. And they were about to break up, in fact, and Chandler wanted to get into management. And so Chandler, his first signing as a manager was Jimmy, and he brought Jimmy to London in a very sort of uh, you know, uh, inconspicuous way originally, because when Jimmy landed, uh, he didn't have a British work permit. And so the only way to get him an audience was for him to play in clubs um, with the house band. And it looked like he was just getting up and jamming with the house band, and that didn't count as work. So he could get away with it. But these clubs happened to be where the social register, entire social register, British pop, happened to go, like the Scotch of St. James, and the Speakeasy, and the Bag of Nails. Every night you would see two or three of the kinks, you'd see the Beatles, the, the Who, everybody would be there. And this was where the, uh, the, the guitar superheroes of the time, who tended to be very much British, um, having learned <laughs> most of their um, skill from America, um, that's where they saw him. And indeed, he had come to London. Uh, the ma main thing that persuaded him to come was the idea of meeting Eric Clapton, who he absolutely idolized. Um, not very long after coming to London, he was asked to sit in, or he asked to sit in, or Chandler asked he could sit in, with a new uh, three-piece that uh, Clapton was involved in, known as Cream. And um, Jimmy, of course, sitting in for Jimmy, was <laughs> there was no sitting involved. There was an awful lot of playing with his teeth and behind his head and his other sort of quasi-sexual acts with his guitar. And Eric Clapton was completely dumbfounded and walked off the stage. I couldn't deal with it at all. Though later they, they did become great, great friends. But this was the effect that Jimmy had. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. Uh, the, the good thing about Chas Chandler was he knew about producing and he had an instinctive feel for producing. But he had to have a manager who was um, had an infrastructure and knew the sort of mechanics of managing. And he, oh, the only manager he knew was the, the animals manager, someone called Mike Jeffrey, who had been ripping the animals off from the very beginning. Um, and 
certainly continued that with Jimmy. But uh, on the sort of principle of better the devil you know, um, that, that was who became uh, in partnership with Chandler, Jimmy Hendrix's manager. Um, and like all pop, pop managers of the time, uh, even Brian Epstein, um, they believed that this music was just a passing fad. Uh, even the absolute height of the Beatles' career, when they were producing this sublime the album, extraordinary galloping maturity and invention um it was still thought this would they, they wouldn't they wouldn't last as a, as a performance and lennon and mccartney would better be better advised to just think of being songwriters in the future that's why they their songs were done by so many other people they wanted to spread themselves around and uh mike jeffrey had no feel for jimmy's music really believe this of course so jimmy was launched on sort of one-nighters all over britain all over england in the most bizarre places he would chandler would send him anywhere with the um two musicians that uh, were found for him uh, both white um and uh, both rather selected for, for not being that good um because the idea was no attention had to be taken away from the front man jimmy um noel redding who was the bass player. In fact, couldn't play the bass when Jimmy met him. He was in a, a band as a guitarist. And it was Jimmy who taught him to play the bass. Um, or occasionally on the records, even Chandler would go back to playing bass. Um, Mitch Mitchell was a pretty uh, loud uh, drummer with a jazzy feel. Um, but really the idea was that these other two were not supposed to take the attention to spotlight off Jimmy. And, uh, but they played in the most bizarre places. They played on the end of Seaside Piers. They, they played once on the edge of Ilkley Moor, this wilderness in Yorkshire, um, which, where people still turned up, of course, to see Jimmy, um, as well as playing in uh, uh, Mike Jeffrey's own club in Newcastle on time. Um, and that was a, a great cult film of the, um, the time uh, called uh, Get Carter. Uh, where Michael Caine plays this hood going around Newcastle and Mike Jeffries was a hood. He wouldn't come from Newcastle. He, he made a lot of money in clubs and also in Mallorca. So Jimmy once had to fly the Atlantic back from America just to open this club of Mike Jeffries in Mallorca. But from then he, uh, Jeffrey launched him into Europe and Scandinavia and what was then West Germany. And uh, uh, the, the, it was racism in Britain. It was it was no less objectionable, but it was more kind of jokey. A lot of the time, people didn't really feel any malice. They just made these silly jokes. Jimmy somehow didn't mind because he thought it made him sound interesting when they called him things like the Wild Man from Borneo um, and Mau Mau, which was the name of the insurrectionist uh, movement in Kenya in the early fifties. Um, Jimmy thought. That, kind of compliment um, it was horrible actually but it wasn't quite as virulent as the American at the time was and in out in Europe in Scandinavia it was far less of a problem so he got a huge following there eventually it was time to bring him back and see how he go back to America and uh, see if he could make it um, which he never had been able to before under a variety of names latterly as Jimmy and the, this was done initially with the famous Monterey Pop Festival in 1967, the first of those great festivals, of, where the, the ethos of love and peace really did seem to be working. And the young did seem to have a, a, a secret that the older generation, the secret of getting together in huge numbers and not trying to harm each other or rob each other or do each other harm. And it was an extraordinary bill that was put together in Monterey in 67, but Jimmy absolutely stole the show with his guitar burning. And it took Jeffrey, Mike Jeffrey, completely by surprise um, because he thought it would be a sort of, you know, a one hit in and out sort of quick fireman job. Um, but of course, then the rest of America was curious about this, uh, this extraordinary phenomenon that had been seen in Monterey. And so Jeffrey had to put together a tour very quickly. And uh, so 
take any sort of engagement that was going, including one uh, opening for the Monkees. The Monkees, the most bubblegum band of all time, a sort of knockoff of the Beatles through a television show initially. In fact, the Monkees, two of them at least, were serious musicians who had to pretend not to be serious musicians. Um, and they were very, very keen on having Jimmy. But Jimmy was, it was the only time Jimmy really ever sort of bombed with the Jimi Hendrix experience, which the trio had become. Um, because all these young, I mean, 12 year olds in the audience screaming for Davy Jones. Um, and so Jimmy rather gave up on that tour. The following year, um, he went back in 68, which was a most troubled year in the US. Um, with the death of the murder, the assassination of Martin Luther King and of Bobby Kennedy, um, dreadful race riots, uh, huge uh, anti-war demonstrations on college campuses, a brutal official reprisals against them. Um, and to be an African-American touring the South with a with two white side men was, well, it was an extraordinary feat of bravery, in fact, which really deserved to be recognized by the civil rights movement. Um, and it was extremely, well, uncomfortable isn't the word in one place. Jimmy very cleverly, Jimmy was clever and Jimmy was highly intuitive. Um, and he actually engaged a member of the Ku Klux Klan as the band's driver because he figured they'd be safe, then indeed they were. They were crouching in the back. Uh, so they couldn't be seen. Uh, but Jimmy sat next to the driver because he thought that was the safest place. He was really remarkable because um, uh, all of these major rock figures are supposed to have a sort of, you know, this self-destructive gene that leads them to over excess um, and sort of just sends them crazy, essentially. Um, Jimmy had, there was much more to Jimmy. He was, Leon said that, um, uh, Jimmy really never had a high school education. He dropped out of high school very early. Yet he knew about things. He knew about astronomy. Um, he would, um, being with his brother, said Leon, was really as good as going to university in their young years. Um, and he was interested in design, in art, um, fabrics, <laughs> all those things you don't associate with rock legends. Um, but there were, there were drugs indeed, um, but he never, there was never a disastrous uh, bust. Um, the FBI and the CIA were both very keen to, because of his enormous influence with uh, young white kids at the time, who were causing such a lot of trouble on the campuses. Um, they, they tagged him as a subversive um, and would very, have loved to bust him. And there was one incident where the, um, he couldn't explain actually how the stuff got into his luggage because it, it, a lot was carried around, but he never, he didn't like heroin, um, it would be mostly pot, and uh, he was peaceable and sweet. The one, you know, you have to address these uh, flaws as well, um, his father had always been a very bad man after drinking whiskey, and it was the same with Jimmy bad man on whiskey, a bad fellow, um, but in general sweet, uh, law-abiding, and um, just, he was <laughs> the only sort of truly adored, I suppose possibly John Lennon, there was, um, this is the other one uh, of these personalities that I, that I dealt with. Um, he was also someone who was restlessly inventive, he produced, um, in Britain, three albums in very, very quick succession, um, which were instant classics. Um, um, he very soon started to be interested in production himself. Um, he wanted to manage as well. He wanted to produce. Um, he wanted to start, he, he liked classical music as well. He, um, he said he wanted to write symphonies. He didn't want to write just sort of three minute pop tunes. His labyrinth in complex guitar style, very soon started edging towards more bebop. Um, he might have, he was very coming very close to the frontiers of jazz. Um, one of the, in his last couple of years, he he jammed with Miles Davis, you know, the, the absolutely the most avant-garde jazz musician 
that time um, and a very difficult character in every way and a very admirable character in many ways. Um, but Miles Davis was completely bewitched by Jimmy's virtuosity. But of course, the pressure of, he was, he was earning a, a huge amount of money very, very quickly. Um, this, a lot of this was being sent by uh, Mike Jeffrey, um, uh, supposedly, because Jimmy was officially still domiciled in New York State, um, uh, to save him from uh, American taxes. He, the money was sent into this uh, offshore account um, and it was never really seen again. That was thanks to Mike Jeffrey. Um, and when the same thing had happened to the animals, um, when Chas Chandler had gone to the Bahamas to try to, tr to track down to the bank, supposedly holding the money, uh, he found the bank had gone out of business, didn't exist anymore. That was the kind of management <laughs> that Jimmy had. Um, but of course, it was very much in Mike Jeffrey's interest to keep him working because Mike Jeffrey, Jeffrey didn't think that this was going to last very long. Um, but Jimmy wanted to push forward the boundaries uh, of his playing. Um, he, he was just like all um, great figures in music and in creativity. He was never really satisfied with what he did. He didn't feel comfortable in singing. Um, how many people told him his voice was wonderful and perfect for the guitar, um, like a lovely sort of velvet underpinning of his wild sort of riot. Um, he never really got, got reconciled with that. He spent his life, his too short life, trying to please and impress his father, which he never did. Uh, he never managed to do that. Even when uh, he had money, he bought his father Al a house. Um, his father complained that the garage wouldn't, uh, was too small for his pickup truck. So Jimmy bought him another house. Um, he never really ever felt and always felt a great longing to be close to his father. And that was a void in his life. He was, he was epically promiscuous. We can't gloss that over. Um, it was at a time when um, that was considered sort of normality for rock stars um, and a rather envied perk of the job. Um, but in Jimmy's case, he was never, I've been told this by many people, he was never uh, at all predatory, he didn't have to be predatory, because um, as uh, someone rather memorably said, it was, uh, uh, Jimmy wasn't a woman, uh, womanizer, the women were Jimmyizers and Hendrixizers. They would uh, literally queue up outside his, his hotel room door um, and sometimes he didn't really he didn't find it all that welcome because he liked to sort of he still found hotel dwelling such a luxury he liked to sort of put a, a scarf over the, the lamp and just settle down and strum his guitar and be by himself um, but in the end uh, he was worked to a terrible state of near physical collapse um, he was living for a time at Woodstock, which was very, very thrilling to him because Bob Dylan lived around there at the time. Unfortunately, Dylan had gone to uh, the Isle of Wight, to where I happened to grow up, um, because instead of appearing at this huge half million audience uh, super event at Woodstock, Dylan went to the island, little island off the south coast of England uh, because the organizers of that festival found out that Dylan's, uh, one of his favorite poets was Alfred Lord Tennyson, who had lived on the Isle of Wight and written a lot on the Isle of Wight. And that Dylan quixotically went to the Isle of Wight. But Jimmy did appear at Woodstock, um, an, a, an event, uh, and a moment, which for many people afterwards, I suppose, was perhaps one of the defining moments of the 1960s. Jimmy appeared and played a, an a cappella version of the Star Spangled Banner, into which he managed to introduce the sound effects of the Vietnam War, uh, a most extraordinary piece of music, which because of the dreadful chaos of the running order at Woodstock and all the bad weather that they'd been, um, Jimmy had to spend the night on site uh, at the festival, sort of shivering in a little, little shack. He had a slightly larger backing group by then. And uh, uh, 
he went on at about 8 30 in the morning when a few bedraggled hippies were just packing up their sleeping bags and trudging away through the mud that was when this amazing mu musical moment happened um but there was a he'd, he'd lived in london his two i suppose he was his two most best relationships with women out of all the hundreds maybe thousands were both with english women both white um Firstly, with Linda Key, um, they were always close. Uh, Jimmy called Linda his blood brother. Jimmy had a American, Native American ancestry on both sides of his family, and they actually mingled their blood in recognition of this bond, which initially was quite platonic, very unusual for Jimmy, um, but became uh, romantic, episodic. But he lived um, for two over two years with a, another English woman who was a, a DJ around some of the clubs at the time, Kathy Etchingham. And it was a quite a domestic sort of existence in, a, in Mayfair, in the heart of Mayfair in Brook Street, in a block of buildings um, where the great composer Handel had also lived. Now, you, now it's like a, a museum to them both. It's called Han, Handel and Hendrix in London. Handel was there much longer than, than Jimmy and actually died there. Um, but uh, Jimmy was convinced he lived, um, uh, he was at 23, Handel was at 25, and uh, he was sure he'd seen Handel's ghost. Uh, he called it an old guy in a nightshirt with a pigtail walk through the wall one evening. Maybe it had a bit too much pot that night, possibly, but he was convinced he'd seen Handel's ghost. Um, but eventually it broke up with Kathy Etch and, and Jimmy, and um, he. <sighs> The Isle of Wight Festival of 1970, which was after the Bob Dylan Festival of 69, um, Jimmy was headlining with uh, an amazing build, including the doors, extraordinary roster of people. But he was in a, he'd been, a, he'd opened a recording studio in New York called Electric Lady. He was really looking forward to getting into the studio. He had so much material recorded that he was way to put into shape, into albums. Um, but he did leave to play this, uh, on the final of the three original enormous Isle of Wight festivals. There are now Isle of Wight festivals that are sort of like gerbils compared to dinosaurs, the old ones. And, um, but uh, Jimmy arrived, played, but then had to make a European, to make the journey worthwhile, had to make a European tour, which he was in a state of utter exhaustion. and. It was a disastrous tour um, where he was several times out of it on drugs, um, on sheer fatigue, on a bad dose, dose of influenza, um, ending with a dreadful uh, chaotic appearance um, on a, an island in the Baltic, um, which um, seemed to take its cue from the dreadful Altamont Festival. Um, the security was run by Hell's Angels and they were beating up everyone and actually doing a lot worse damage than the Angels did at the Altamont Festival. And Jimmy's great um, support, really, was a man called Billy Cox, who'd been in the, in the army with. Billy Cox always kind of had a fatherly concern for Jimmy. And well, if Billy Cox was, Billy Cox watched his back. Unfortunately, Billy Cox uh, was given an inadvertent uh, first dose of LSD and uh, went into a terrible bad trip and had to go back to America. And so Jimmy was without that uh, protector that he, he so relied on. Back in London, um, lots of things were happening. There were court cases. Uh, um, he'd signed up to a very cheapo label in New York a few years before, um, five years before, in fact, just, just before he, he was discovered by Chandler and, and signed a contract and this promoter of this rather cheapo promoter record boss was trying to get a share of his money. There was uh, litigation over a child, paternity allegations, and all sorts of things seemed to be happening, sort of negative things. But he met up with a, a young woman um, called Monica Dannemann that he'd met on tour in West Germany a little uh, previous year. And uh, they, got together since then. Um, but he rather fell into, she was quite a sort of 
um, she had been a, an ice skater, an ice skater to sort of championship level and an athlete, um, and was quite sort of strong-minded. And Jimmy was not, Jimmy hated to say no, essentially. Um, and Monica in London had hired a car. So that meant for her that Jimmy was always in her power, but for Jimmy just, oh, someone to drive me around, how great. Um, and Jimmy was in London and seen by various people in these early days of September, mid-September. Um, but uh, um, instead of remaining at the solid and comfortable Cumberland Hotel at Marble Arch, where he was registered, um, he ended up spending more time with Monica at a sort of a strange little hotel in Notting Hill Gate, which then was not at all a uh, chic area, a very deprived area. And um, in this strange little uh, hotel called the Samarkand, it was not at all like a hotel. You, it was more sort of catered for student groups from abroad. But Monica had a little uh, bed sit on, in the basement. And Jimmy was there with her. Um, and the, all sorts of people were in London at the time who should have been looking out for him, but either didn't bother or didn't know where he was because he wasn't at the Cumberland Hotel. The, the very the good road manager, um, his name was Jerry Stickles, um, only lived two streets away from the Samarkand. Didn't know Jimmy was there, uh, thought he was at the Cumberland. So when this emergency call came, uh, it fortunately did, um, and Jim, Jimmy was in trouble and needed help. And uh, Stickles went to the Cumberland, and go straight to where Jimmy was. And the, the events, I mean, the events that lead to this tragic and, in my view, avoidable death uh, were that um, uh, Jimmy and Monica had spent time together. Uh, they spent a day around London. Um, Jimmy bumped into Cathy Etchingham, his former living uh, partner. Um, she was totally shocked by the sight of him. She said he just all that joy and fizz and excitement and or it seemed to have gone out of him. Um, and that evening, uh, he was at the, he, he went to a party, ironically, almost next door to the Cumberland Hotel. Monica drove him there and then picked him up later and took him back to this little bed sitting room. And uh, he, he found it very hard to sleep. And he asked her if she had something. She did. She had a, because of a, she said, a residual, uh, um, uh, pain from skating accident. She had a, a very strong uh, continental made uh, barbiturate sleeping tablet called Vesperax, uh, which insanely uh, was every tablet was a double dose. You had to break the tablet in half to get the dose. And it seems that um, Jimmy uh, took some of these, but took twice the amount that he thought he was taking. He thought he was taking about eight. Have been around 16 actual doses. Um, although uh, one later pathologist said that he was in such a bad state that even a low dose of Vesperax would have finished him off. Um, but what was so strange about death was that um, Monica's story of these hours fluctuated wildly. There were about 14 different versions. Um, but one that seemed to be borne out was that she found Jimmy in distress, having gone out to buy some cigarettes, left him sleeping apparently peacefully, but returned to find, uh, to see vomit trickling out of his mouth, and he was clearly in distress. And she phoned, uh, she tried to get hold of a doctor, but it got, eventually got through to someone called Albinia Bridges, um, who, uh, who was part of the sort of, actually one of the few people who would rather like Monica Mist people around Jimmy didn't, but um, who happened to be spending the night with Eric Burden, his friend Eric Burden, the animal. And Burden uh, and Alvinia both rushed to this, to the Samarkand basement, but they both said that it was, uh, this was a, a, an Indian summer, 1970, in September. And they both said that, that, that it was the early hours of the morning and they arrived, uh, dawn would have broken, he said in, in the dawn, dawn would have been very, very early, and there was dew on all the cars outside, parked outside. 
Um, but the call to the ambulance was not made, as the, as the dispatcher's log showed, until around just after 11 a.m., all those hours later. And you have this idea that there are people, roadies, uh, other people, in, were in that room getting rid of, getting rid of drugs, evidently, um, at a time when Jimmy could, might have been able to be resuscitated. As it was, um, it was really by the time he reached a little hospital, it wasn't a very big hospital, very old fashioned, uh, called um, Mary Abbott's in Kensington. By the time he was uh, taken to A and E, there he, he was dead. Um, and uh, but one of the two doctors who um, tried to revive him and failed noted a, a very peculiar detail, which was that. Uh, he seemed to be saturated in red wine. Uh, and yet, in the subsequent post-mortem, very little wine. He drank very little wine that night. Not only a sip, in fact, of red wine, but mostly drank white wine, but not very much. And uh, it seemed like he had been saturated uh, from the... Uh, he had so much in his windpipe that uh, it was impossible to suction it out. There was too much there. And this doctor in John Bannister um, said he seemed to have drowned in wine. Uh, this is a detail that still really hasn't been explained. It is very, very strange. Um, and there have been many, many theories that have been put forward for the, for the death. One was that it was the dreadful manager, Mike Jeffrey, because Jimmy was about, his management contract with Jimmy was about to expire. But in fact, Jimmy still would have been um, obligated, connected to Jeffrey for some time after that. So Jeffrey would have been, you know, spiting himself. Another one was that it was the American government and Jimmy was on a, a list of what were considered subversives at the time under the completely paranoid Nixon government, which according to his brother Leon, had him rated at the same level of danger as later on Osama bin Laden after 9-11 according to Leon, uh, or the Mafia, because the Mafia were moving into Hop. Um, Jimmy had actually been kidnapped by the Mafia um, the previous year because um, the Mafia had a club uh, where he often played. And uh, he, he thought everybody played, you know, everybody knew that the mob were running these places like in Las Vegas. Sinatra and everybody knew. Um, but it seemed that it was a couple of wannabe uh, wise guys who, who nabbed Jimmy um, because they wanted to move into the music business as they saw it, which might start by kidnapping Jimmy and getting a ransom. And in fact, um, he was released by these wise guys when senior figures in the mob told them to cut it out and let him go. Do not har harm a hair of his afro, one of these senior wise guys is supposed to have said. So what it really, I think, I'm sure comes down to is that um, he was in the hands of someone who later claimed years afterwards that they had been engaged. Jimmy actually already had a fiance, um, a Danish actress, who was apparently rather a nice person. And if he'd stayed with her, possibly things would have turned out differently. But then a monarch, Monica brought the, the total allegedly to two fiancés at this time of death. And uh, she swore they were going to get married and they dis discussed children and everything. Um, but it much more fits the profile of the sort of obsessive fan that people didn't really know about in those days. I mean, later on, obsessive fan turned into killers. Um, but in this case, possibly an obsessive fan who did, although unwittingly, do Jimmy harm. Um, and uh, racism, I'm, I'm very sad to say, kicked in even then because, um, as Kathy Etchingham told me, uh, he was lucky uh, to be autopsied because when he was brought in, nobody at the hospital recognized him and he was just thought to be another junkie from Notting Hill. Uh, there was a very, very cursory inquest and uh, um, he was taken back and buried in a rather simple grave which in Seattle, which later was 
in the Grand Mausoleum, of course, with the years. Um, and the story rather faded because quite honestly, it was happening a lot at that time. It had happened to Brighton Jones in 69, uh, dead at 27. It happened to Janice Joplin. A year later, it happened, two years later, it happened to, a year later, two years later in Paris to, to Morrison. And that just seemed to be what they did. And it was even sought to be a sort of sine qua non of being a rock immortal. You, you, you accomplished your own death at the age of 27. But as the years went on, um, interest did revive in the case, and particularly with Kathy Etchingham, who had genuinely loved him, and he loved her, but could not simply be incapable of fidelity, unfortunately. And so she managed to get the case reopened by Scotland Yard later in the 80s, and uh, a full investigation was carried out, but the of course the trail was very cold, and they didn't find anything could you know warrant really properly reopening the case um, but Jimmy is is with us and um, with us in monuments mainly in Seattle I, I understand and, uh, and elsewhere on the Isle of Wight where I came from there's a statue of Jimmy um, on the cliffs in those uh, that part of the west of the Isle of Wight where Tennyson used to stride on the downs and recite his poetry into the wind is also where Jimmy used to, has played with these, his flapping sleeves. And uh, they could have, a, as well as a Handel and Hendrix in London, they could have a Tennyson and Hendrix in, in white. Hasn't happened. But um, he is everywhere. And any guitarist of any consequence to this day uh, acknowledges a, a debt to him. Um, and they can be think they can be like him, but there's something there, as with all true genius, that is unrepeatable and unique. And uh, so he is, he's with us. Have I gone on for a long enough time? <laughs> yeah, uh, that have, this has been really great. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, this, you know, hearing about him, he does loom so large here in Seattle and, um, so it's been really great to listen to you talk talk through his life. Um, we do have one question here, um, and it's a really good one. I'm not sure we'll have time for too many, but um, if, if you do have a question, feel free to submit it, and we'll see if we can get to it. Um, but this first one is from Allison. Um, she says, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a high school teacher, and my class of uh, and my class is American literature of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it's just finished the 60s and 70s. Her students are totally into it. Of course, they gravitate to music and lyrics as an expression of culture and politics. Um, and there, they, ha they have a couple of questions. So the first one um, they would like to know is, what do you think we have gained from the music of Jimi Hendrix um, and all of the icons that you've written about from, from that time period? It's a unique period in history, apart from anything else. It's a time when the um, cultural hegemony of the US, uh, where pop music was concerned, was seriously challenged for a few years by young men who had been infatuated with American rock and roll um, and folk music too, um, and who created their own version of it. The Beatles with a kind of salty Liverpudlian wit, uh, the Rolling Stones with a kind of London sneer, um, Ray Davis with a touch of Charles Dickens, um, so many of them. It was a time when great, there was a lot of awful music around, we shouldn't forget that in the 60s, but it was a time when it, there seemed to be no end to this stream of brilliant uh, um, musical creations from Britain, which up to that, then it was considered rather sort of a joke, you know, stuck in the past, Shakespeare, Hamlet, all of that, um, which then started this wonderful sort of reaction because uh, bands in America started picking up from British bands. This wonderful sort of cultural, almost duel was fought for several years between the Beatles and the Beach Boys. They were each kind of goading and challenging each other to go one better. Um, so this is music. In the case of the Beatles, I mean, I, I think they, are, they, they were described by their wonderful publicist, uh, Eric Taylor, as 20th century's greatest romance. But I think they have 
perhaps the greatest machine for human happiness of modern times, because you can take a, a young three-year-old today and play a Beatles song, and they love it. The charm is extraordinary still. The charm is unextinguishable in the music. But there is so much else. It's, it's, it's wonderful history and uh, timeless entertainment, recreation. Um, and these, I, t I try to write my books. I'm not really a biographer. I don't think I am because I couldn't sit in an archive for 10 years. I, I look at really the, as, as non-fiction novels about young men um, who have extraordinary changes in their lives, rather like the young men at the heart of Dickens' novel. Um, rather like David Copperfield, rather like Nick Colby. Um, he's a very, very simple young man who had something extraordinary. And in their, in their way, of course, were extraordinary too. Um, the spread of personalities and eccentrics in this music is wonderful. Yeah, and, and the second part of the, her question um, is, uh, how do you, um, how do you account for music being sort of the the major chronicler of of that time period? Well, it started to be a reflection of its time. Some parts of music, Woody Guthrie, people, but it it created a culture. It wasn't just a market. It wasn't just an entertainment were to begin with a rather embattled minority in the years of rock and roll, because all the adults, that meant people over 30, disapproved of it, said it was like a con trick. Um, and it would, it would evaporate in a few weeks, and of course it didn't. Um, and later on it became a, a powerful culture that affected all the culture. So every age group in the end uh, was listening to the music. Uh, people like the Queen of England, you know, were asking what the Beatles were up to. At the, places where she was giving people knighthoods and things like that. The Beatles are turning rather strange, aren't they? She, the big queen would say that. Um, and that's an extraordinary, extraordinary impact for this, this orphan music to have had. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, Philip, I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, your presentation was so uh, all, 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 all encompassing. So it was really fascinating to listen to. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching uh, today as well. Uh, if you are interested in purchasing a copy of Philip's book, I encourage you to use the link on your live stream page. Um, it's going to take you right over to Elliott Bay where you can get a copy. Um, and remember that uh, Town Hall is still doing a lot of events, so check out our calendar. Um, you can follow this Crowdcast channel by clicking the follow button in the top right corner as well to get uh, to get updates. Um, so thank you so much again, Philip, for joining us all the way from the UK, um, and hope you have a you have a great evening. Thank you, and you too, Thank you. Bye. Thanks. So I leave. Yes. <laughs>